Welcome back to 12 Days in March. Today we'll tackle congenital neurological abnormalities, a topic that causes a headache for many students. This picture accurately depicts what most students experience when trying to cram all of these defects into their already full brains. Don't worry though, we'll make it simple for you so you'll have no problem nailing these questions on test day. Here's a list of what you'll be able to recognize by the end of this video. Neural tube defects, posterior fossa abnormalities, holoprosencephaly in the anterior fossa, and syringomyelia in the spinal cord. We'll start off with the neural tube. The NBME would like to beat into your brain that prenatal vitamins are a big deal and they'll use neural tube defects as their hammer. Before we go any further, remember that the neural tube normally closes in the fourth week of development and a folate deficiency will lead to neural tube defects. In the amniotic fluid, you will see increases in alpha fetoprotein and acetylcholinesterase since they leak out of the patent neural tube. Now let's meet the players. Anencephaly and spina bifida. An open tube up top gives you anencephaly, while an open tube at the bottom gives you spina bifida. If you fail to close the neural tube up top, you'll get anencephaly, which is where your forebrain, that is everything above the midbrain, fails to develop. How will this present in utero? Increases in amniotic alpha fetoprotein and acetylcholinesterase, as well as polyhydramnios, because the fetus cannot swallow amniotic fluid without a forebrain telling them to do so. If they show you a picture of a fetus, the head will look kind of like a frog because the eyes are disproportionately large since the rest of the head is missing. Again, the big ticket items for anencephaly are an excess of amniotic fluid and high amniotic alpha fetoprotein and acetylcholinesterase. Pretty straightforward so far. Now let's move on to spina bifida, which occurs when you fail to close the neural tube down near the tailbone. Spina bifida occurs with variants, occulta, meningocele, and meningomyelocele. First is spina bifida occulta, where the neural tube fails to close but there is no herniation of the dura or spinal cord. The giveaway for spina bifida occulta will be a tuft of hair in the midline of the baby's low back and no neurological defects. Occulta means hidden, and as the name suggests, this will be the hardest variant of spina bifida to recognize on test day because there's nothing about this defect that screams neuro. The only tidbit to remember is that the tuft of hair in a baby's low back is equal to spina bifida occulta. Next for spina bifida are meningocele and meningomyelocele. Both will involve herniation, but only meningomyelocele will only have the spinal cord herniating outwards. You can remember this because myelo refers to myelin, so a meningomyelocele will involve both the meninges and the spinal cord, while a meningocele only involves herniation of the meninges. You should expect a higher likelihood of neurological impairment in the lower extremities with meningomyelocele. Specifically, you might see incontinence from cauda equina involvement, as well as bilateral leg paralysis and areflexia with absent sensation in both lower extremities. The NBME is unlikely to delve into the vocabulary of whether you're dealing with meningocele or meningomyelocele, but they can present a baby with a fluid-filled cyst in their low back, plus or minus neurological deficits, and then ask you about folate deficiency or amniocentesis findings. You may be asked about what drugs can cause a folate deficiency in utero. Two main drugs to be familiar with are valproic acid and methotrexate, but like all things on step one, you won't be asked directly about these side effects. Instead, be on the lookout for a pregnant woman with epilepsy or with an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis whose child develops anencephaly or spina bifida because of valproate or methotrexate. So that knocks off the neural tube defects. Let's move to the posterior fossa. We'll start the discussion with a focus on cerebral aqueduct stenosis. This one is short and sweet, as long as you remember that the cerebral aqueduct connects the third and fourth ventricles. You'll have no problem envisioning that a stenosis or blockage of the fluid's passageway will cause an obstructive hydrocephalus. And how will the NBME present those signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus in children? These include increased head size with a bulging fontanelle, seizures, increased intracranial pressure with accompanying papilledema, and or nonspecific findings like vomiting, fussiness, or poor feeding. 
you should have no trouble identifying this abnormality on test day. But recall, aqueduct stenosis is only one cause of hydrocephalus. Our next posterior fossa lesion is the Dandy Walker malformation. Here, you've replaced the cerebellar vermis with a fluid-filled cyst, and consequently, you will not be a Dandy Walker. See what I did there? Since the vermis controls coordination in the proximal muscles, particularly with walking, replacing it with a cyst will indeed mean that you won't be Dandy at walking. And here's an image that you should be familiar with. You can see what's left of the cerebellum here along with the massive cyst you might also see some hydrocephalus. On the test, you can anticipate seeing this image presented with a kid who keeps on falling in any instance that they're testing you on Dandy Walker. And the final posterior fossa lesions include the dreaded Chiari malformations type 1 and type 2. The one-liner for both of these malformations is that parts of the cerebellum are in places where they shouldn't be. For type 1, the less severe type, this is caused by ectopia of the cerebellar tonsils, which means that they're just in a weird place. You might see this picture to go along with it. It's subtle, but look at the cerebellum and see how far down it extends, much further than you would typically expect. The classic patient will be described as a young adult with headaches and maybe some cerebellar symptoms like ataxia or dysmetria. Then they'll show you this image on the bottom left. Be on the lookout for a Chiari 1 malformation whenever they give you a young adult with headaches and a sagittal image like this. The key association with Chiari 1 malformation is syringomyelia. Think of the 1 as fitting inside of the syrinx and you'll be all set here. Finally, Chiari 2 malformations are much more severe and happen when the cerebellar vermis and tonsils actually herniate through the foramen magnum and that's bad news. You can expect some hydrocephalus in infants from obstructed flow of CSF and the key association here is with meningomyelocele. With Chiari 2 malformations, you can get two things herniating through the spine, the dura and the spinal cord. That should keep Chiari 2 malformations together with meningomyelocele. You just need to be aware that this is how they'll come after you with Chiari malformations, a sagittal MRI plus some nonspecific symptoms like headache and ataxia in an infant or young adult. If they're showing you a sagittal MRI, immediately look at the cerebellum for Dandy Walker versus Chiari malformation. Chances are it's one of those two. Let's move on to holoprosencephaly, a particularly confusing disorder that we've made easy for you. You'll be begging for questions about it. With holoprosencephaly, there's a lot going on. The bottom line is that the left and right hemispheres of the brain fail to separate. This spectrum can present with something as mild as a cleft lip or cleft palate, or something as severe as a full-on cyclops baby. There's a few associations to be aware of. One is a mutation in the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway. Another is fetal alcohol syndrome. The last association is trisomy 13, aka the Patau syndrome. The syndrome is characterized by midline defects like omphalocele of the umbilical cord, cleft lip, and holoprosencephaly. What will you see on MRI of the brain? One single ventricle. Here's a really silly mnemonic to tie all that information together, so take it or leave it. Holoprose the Cyclops is 39 years old and an alcoholic. He just plays Sonic all day long. It's a dumb mnemonic, but I did warn you. And to close out the content before some sample questions, we'll finish off with syringomyelia. What happens in syringomyelia is that a syrinx forms right in the middle of the cervical thoracic spinal cord. Syrinx is just a weird way to say cyst. You'll definitely knock out the anterior white commissure where the pain and temperature fibers cross. So what you're left with is loss of pain and temperature sensation with sparing of fine touch and vibration in a cape-like distribution. If the syrinx is large enough, some arm weakness may be noted. Syringomyelia may occur on a congenital basis or secondary to trauma or surgery. Here's how the NBME will come after you on this topic. They'll tell you that someone has numbness to pain and temperature in their bilateral upper back and arms only, plus or minus upper extremity weakness, and then they'll give you this subtle MRI. That streak of white in the middle of the spinal cord is the fluid-filled cyst. Can you remember which of the other congenital abnormalities was associated with syringomyelia? Nice work if you guessed Chiari 1. Remember that the 1 fits inside the syrinx. Nice work, dudes. And in the next installment, We'll see how the boards like to come after you with some practice questions. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, 
please contact me at 12 days. Thank you.